Welcome everyone to the Changing Minds podcast. This is Owen Fitzpatrick. And today I'm really excited. I'm joined by the wonderful Sylvie Di Giusto. Now, before I introduce Sylvie and before I give you a taste of what is to come in this episode, just to share with you a really exciting bit of information. So next Monday on June the 26th, at 2.30 p.m. Eastern, that's 7.30 p.m. Irish time, that's 8.30 p.m. Eastern Central European time, I will be doing a free masterclass called the five simple strategies you can use to land clients and become a highly paid thought leader this year. This is going to be one hour of me just teaching. And if if you know my style, you'll know that I just pack a massive amount into the hour. And then at the end of that, I'll be telling you about the thought leaders mentorship that I have that I set up in 2020 and that I'm opening up for a couple of days at the end of this month. But you've got two opportunities to be able to attend this masterclass. If you'd like to, it's the 26th of June, which is the Monday, and also the 28th of June, I'll be doing it again, all over again. And so if you're interested, go to ownfitzpatrick.com forward slash masterclass. That's ownfitzpatrick.com forward slash backslash or whatever the slash is, masterclass, one of those slashes. If you just type it in, it'll happen. Anyway, enough about that. Today, like I said, I'm going to be introducing a very, very dear friend of mine. And I want to tell you about her as a friend, but first, let me give you a taste of her biography, and it is quite a bio. So Sylvie DiGiusto is an international keynote speaker. She brings her expertise from successful corporate career in Europe to every presentation. As a consultancy firm, she implemented online and in-person training and development initiatives for Fortune 100 companies. Well-versed in the study of social and cultural norms, personal beliefs, and values, as well as cognitive biases, oh, I love them, and thought patterns. Her 20 years in L&D leaves a deep understanding in how the power of choice impacts organizations' sales, leadership, and growth. Now, extraordinary leaders and professionals at many of the most respected organizations and associations of the world, from American Express to American Airlines, Hilton to Nespresso, Microsoft to Prudential, and even the U.S. Air Force, Trust Sylvie to help them make the right decisions that grow their brands and bottom lines. Building on her five cornerstones of modern emotional intelligence, visual, behavioral, verbal, digital, and social intelligence, Sylvie gives her audiences the power of choice, a conscious decision-making framework that allows us to understand our perceptions, choose our own behaviors, and determine the best outcomes. She's the author of The Image of Leadership and the new book, which is an incredible book. And let me just say, if you are in any way interested in emotional intelligence, personal branding, or just communication, it has to be a part. That's it there, right? It's a beautiful cover, nice big book. If you're looking for a read to bring to the beach, I would highly recommend maybe not this one because it's big, but have it back in the apartment or in your holiday home after you've had that nice journey to the beach because it is worth a read. Phenomenal stuff. And the upcoming Make Me Feel Important, in which she leads you deep into the customer experience. It shows you how to make every interaction count. Sylvie takes your organization on an entertaining, spectacular, and thought-provoking journey from the brain, the mind, and unconscious to the conscious, and ultimately to the heights of personal, professional, and organizational success. Please welcome Sylvie Di Giusto. Sylvie, that bio was as thorough as your book, as thorough as everything you do. It is so nice to have you, my very dear friend. How are you? I am so impressed. Can I ask for a favor? Could you come with me to all my events and every single time make my introduction for me or record one? That was quite impressive. Thank you so much, my friend. (laughs) No problem. My pleasure, Sylvie. My pleasure. So look, obviously we met over the last few years or whatnot, but we got to get to know each other as you hosted a mastermind earlier this year. And in that, I got to spend a good bit of time with you. I just want to say, like, one of the things, just to let the listeners and the viewers know, is Sylvie knows, in terms of the National Speakers Association, Sylvie knows everybody. And not only does Sylvie know everybody, everybody loves her. And (laughs) you wonder why one person could be loved by so many people. And then you meet her, and she's just so generous and kind and helpful. And I learned a lot from you, Sylvie, over the course of just getting to know you. But I would love, actually, given the fact that you have come from Austria, I would love you to share just a brief sort of background of what brought you to doing the work you do today in helping Mm -hmm. transform organizations through your expertise on 
emotional intelligence or what you call the fair advantage? Well, I'm going to start right at the beginning when I was around five years old. My brother told me it was the first time that he heard me say something. When our friends, neighbors, teachers asked little children like myself at five, what do you want to be when you are grown up? All the children answered something like, I want to be a teacher. I want to be a pilot. I want to be a firefighter. And he said it was the first time that he heard me say that when people ask me that question that I said, I want to be an American. And so since ever then, and I don't even know where I have this dream of because None of my family members is from the United States. I have never been in the United States until I moved there, but I always had this dream of living here. And that dream, it didn't went very well. So I had a very regular career. First, I started out as a teacher. Then I get, got into human resources and training and development. Though this is my version of saying it. You said it way more impressive. But I built up a management academy for the biggest retail and tourism company and was responsible for their top 100 leaders out of 100,000 employees. And, you know, throughout that time, I always was somehow involved when they got hired and when they got fired and everything in between. And what always fascinated me and bothered me in the same time was that very often when we hired top leaders for the organization, they walked into the room, they said all the right things, they behaved exactly the way we wanted them to behave, they even looked the way we wanted them to look like. They did all the right things and instantly impressed us. And then years later, I had to fire them because of a total lack of performance. And so very early, I was fascinated by perceptions. Why do we think specific things about people and either are right or totally wrong? And on the other hand, we had so many young and ambitious people in that organization. And I wondered, why do we never identify them for these positions? Possibly they would have done that job much better than the outside hire. And I realized that they do, didn't stand out to us as potential leaders and blended in and also didn't give us an opportunity to pick them and see them and help them craft and get ready for this leadership position. And so a long story short, I started to studying everything around, as you just said, cognitive biases, perceptions, first impression, last impressions, personal branding, but in a very corporate environment, because it's very different to brand yourself within an organization than when you are a small business owner. And then to close the circle, 30 years later, after saying I want to be an American, an opportunity came up and I left behind a 20-year corporate career from one day to the other. I instantly quit my job and moved with a nine-day-old newborn on my lap to the United States. And here I am. And since I'm here, I kind of changed sides and I'm now on the speaker side. The speakers, back then I always hired speakers for our trainings and development programs and conferences. And so I changed sides and now help leaders better understand how they see themselves, how they perceive themselves and how the world sees them. So on that, Sylvia, I'd love to start just by, I suppose, referring back to some of the work you've done in the past on the image of leadership. What are some of the most important things that leaders need to know about how to present themselves to others? So some of the things that maybe, for example, aren't as obvious as others. Well, first of all, you have to appear, behave and communicate like a leader long before you become a leader, meaning, you know, none of the presidents of any single country in the world have become presidents overnight, usually, right? And there was a long career path behind them. And at the very beginning of that career path, somebody thought, this looks like presidential material to me and made them realize that this could be an option and possibly mentored them to this position. And the same is for you as a leader. If you want to become the head of a department, if you want to become the CEO of your company, you don't just start appearing, behaving, and communicating like a CEO the career step beforehand. You have to start at the very beginning of your career with that end goal in mind. The second one is that I believe that leaders lead by example. 
right? And if you have certain expectations to your team when it comes to their appearance, behavior, and communication, you need to lead by example and go first. You need to jump off that cliff first so that others follow you. But the most underestimated responsibility I find for leaders that even leaders very often don't realize is that in my opinion, as a leader, your most important job is not to create followers. It is to create new leaders. Every single team member in your department or circle of responsibility should be able to step up at every given moment and take your job. And I know that it doesn't sound good to some because they think, oh my God, I don't want to give my job to somebody in your team. But the main work you have to do as a leader is to create more leaders for your organization. So I love that. I love the fact that what you're talking about there in terms of the image of leadership isn't solely about, for example, the appearance and behaviors and the way you communicate, as you pointed out. There's also those elements of helping people progress in their career. Mm -hmm. There's elements of making sure that you're leading by example. You're ensuring that you become the kind of person that other people need to follow and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You also talk about the first seven seconds. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that's what you refer to in terms of when we meet someone for the first time. Could you just talk about what are some of the best strategies that you found to help ensure you convey a great first impression? So first impressions are very important in terms of perception because people don't like to change their minds. Our brain is actually quite lazy. That's why we often take a shortcut and just take the information that we initially thought and look for proof of it. And so seven seconds, the number isn't really important. It's just one of the studies that I use for my work it shows that we can make up to 11 decisions about somebody in those first moments. If somebody is successful or not, knowledgeable or not, or very important as a leader, trustworthy or not. And so you as a leader, as a listener, I ask you, what do you show in those first micro moments? Might it be five seconds or 10 seconds or milliseconds? that you are a trustworthy leader. Because afterwards, a variety of cognitive biases is working against you. Confirmation bias will make sure that people look for proof, for confirmation, while ignoring anything that goes against their first initial opinion about you, if you are trustworthy or not. Anchoring bias will make sure that they anchor on the first piece of information and have a hard time letting it go. Negativity bias will make sure that if there is a tiny detail in your appearance, behavior, or communication that shows them that there is something wrong, that doesn't speak for the fact that you are trustworthy, they will instantly find it because our brain automatically focus on the things that are wrong while ignoring the things that are right. And so I could go on and on now. There are around 185 biases we know about right now. And while I start out with the first impression um, information, you need to know that afterwards, these very powerful sources are working against you and for you. And we will always make mistakes, all of us, during those first seven seconds. We will always imprint something that we didn't want to imprint. How often did we leave a meeting and thought, oh, I wish I would have said this or that, or I wish I would have done this or that. So we will always make conscious or unconscious mistakes. But at least a part of you, of those micro moments in the beginning, I encourage you to control because you can control this to your advantage too. If you imprint during those first micro moments what you would like to imprint and it's something positive, confirmation bias will also look for proof. Anchoring bias will also anchor that information in their brain, right? And so that is my work around first and lasting impressions and everything in between. This is where we pivot nice and naturally to your new book, which I love, which I think is a phenomenal book, Discover Your Fair Advantage, is one of the things I love about your book is you really break down through a very sort of, I love structure. My brain works very, even though it might seem to people and my way of communicating with people is often chaotic. I'm a bit chaotic in the head. I also have this love of structure and your book is so well structured. You start off by talking about a 
a few of the necessary important elements around presenting a sort of a USP or unique selling proposition to the world. You start off by talking about developing a habit of standing out, cultivating and realizing the necessity of being visible, challenging yourself to be self-aware, which I think is one of the crucial, most critical skills, not just of leaders, but anyone in life. Mm -hmm. I think self-awareness is something far too often missing. And obviously it's one of the cornerstones of emotional intelligence as well. And then intention, the intention of branding yourself. And I love how that's all laid out before you get into the actual 15 elements. Could you talk about what made you sort of go there? Like what was the impetus that got you to start off by looking at the importance of these elements, like standing out, being visible, awareness mm -hmm. and branding? Because I haven't really seen it laid out like that before, but I found mm -hmm. it enormously useful because it really sets you up and then you go deep diving into, so these are the qualities that you want to yes. brand yourself with internally and externally. Did the following thought ever cross your mind? I feel like I'm the best kept secret in my industry. And if your answer is yes, then this book is for you. Or if you feel like I'm the best kept secret in my organization, or I'm in the best kept secret in the market, because I found throughout my work when I helped leaders with their image and when I helped them to realize what their appearance, their behavior, their communication, their digital footprint says about them, that many of them didn't do the ground work to tell me what they actually want to be known for, how they actually want to be perceived, what is unique about them and what they want to stand out for. And and then also tell me that nobody in the entire world can see their uniqueness, can explore their uniqueness. Like going back when I told you I was in corporations, those young, ambitious people who could have done that job way better, but didn't stand out for us. So I truly believe that as a leader, you have to do several things. But some of the first ones is you have to commit to standing out and standing out for the right reasons. So that you increase your visibility level to a level where you're not just unknown for something unique or stand out for something unique, but actually are recommended for something unique and referred in rooms where you are not present. So we, in terms of visibility, very often think about ourselves alone, but I think especially in the corporate environment as leaders, it is important that people in power or decision makers know us and our superpowers so well that they drop our name in the right moment to the right people with the right information that is needed to solve a specific problem. But before that happens, you need to identify what is unique about you. And so throughout the years, I ask that question to leaders and really do I get answers or answers that are deep enough, because when I ask leaders, what is unique about you? Most often I hear things like, wow, oh, I have a lot of empathy for my team, right? Or I'm a great communicator. And then I look around and say, well, who in this room doesn't have a lot of empathy for their team or isn't a great communicator? And so those answers are usually very high level on the surface. And you will find that with these answers, you put yourself in nothing but a comparison trend because another leader will always say, but I have more empathy and I am a better communicator. So the book is really about helping people to identify what is unique for themselves. Where are they a category of one and how can they phrase it in a way so that it's attractive to decision makers? and repeatable for decision makers so that they drop your name at the right moment in the right rooms. What's wonderful about this is it's not only helpful for, let's say speakers like myself or coaches or any form of thought leaders, right? It's also really helpful, as you pointed out, for leaders in an organization mm -hmm. to get promoted, for example. It's really useful for anyone in an organization that has any interest in sort of having their personal brand position them in such a way that makes them more likely to get promoted. It's useful in terms of even dating, you could argue, because <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. like it really does have a massive amount of appeal for a lot mm -hmm. of different people. And once again, I want to go back to, again, I know I keep using this word, but it's a wonderful word because it's something that's not often done, especially in this modern world. And that's the thoroughness 
with which you looked at it. So for example, if you go to most marketing people or experts, some brilliant experts in terms of marketing yourself, they'll generally talk about a handful of what you've put in the book. So they'll talk about, okay, so what is your unique differentiator in terms of what you do better than anyone else? Or they'll talk about your authority or your credibility or what people have said about you. But you really walk through, I mean, just even looking at your core values and beliefs, and just going to read some of them out, your origin story, the natural talents or gifts that, you know, come natural to you, your proficiencies in terms of skills or competencies, your authority, your experience in terms of the lessons that you've learned over your life, the endorsements you've gotten, the achievements you've had, the solutions and the problems that you solve, the location that you're in terms of who you're competing against, your passions and drive, your volunteer work, your quirks, like all of those, like there's so many in there that yeah. gives people a really unique opportunity to go through and if you read the book or if you go through these 15 and you don't have at least some great ideas for the USP, I'll mm -hmm. be absolutely stunned, blown over. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so critical in a world where we do need to stand out, where we are competing with so many more people, especially worldwide or globally. I want to be a bit selfish here. And I want to ask from a speaker's perspective and from my perspective as a speaker, what are some of the ones of the 15 that you in particularly think are most important for someone like us? You know, I actually don't think that it's different from industry to industry or profession to profession. What you need to realize in general is what is unique about you is not just one factor. It's the combination of many factors. And that's why I went so deep into those 15 different areas so that when at the end you will create a unique selling proposition about yourself, you realize, oh, wow. I'm really a category of one. There is nobody out there who is the same as I am. But in general, some of my most favorite and most challenging areas, when I work with leaders on their origin and story, because we are so driven to only see ourselves as professional providers in an organization or without, but we all come with a personal history. And that personal history has built the human being we are nowadays. It has influenced us heavily. And rarely do people commit to that. And so you might have grown up with 18 siblings. Well, that says something about your teamwork abilities, right? You might have grown up with a single mom. Well, that says something probably about your independence. You might have grown up in poverty or you might have to move in 17 different countries. So I always like and enjoy when people realize, oh, wow, I have that childhood or that past and that history and origin and story. And I do not use that to my advantage at my work today, even if we all know I took specific traits from it away. And that is very at the beginning of the book and also in my sessions where I always enjoy, ah, now they are getting it. Now we are digging really deep. I think one of the toughest ones is competition and dominance. That is always the area where most people struggle and where we have to really work hard to find out what do you do different than your competitor and not just better. And so... First of all, it is difficult to realize who is my competitor. This might be your competitor, might be another organization, another company, might be a, another person within your company or outside of your company, or might be a future competitor. Maybe artificial intelligence is your competitor. So first to define the circle of competitors you actually work against is quite difficult. And then to find something that is different and not just better. Because again, if I usually ask leaders or professionals and say, what do you do different than your competitor? They say something along the lines, well, we have better customer service or we have shorter delivery times or we have better pricing. And then I would just need to go over to your competitor. And once again, you are in a comparison trip because your competitor will say, no, that's not true. We have excellent customer service and we can even deliver faster. And so it's hard work to find something that only you can offer and nobody else. And if you don't mind, I'm going to share my example because it makes that obvious. 
years ago, I have been invited in New York City. We both live in New York City to a TV show. One day, a producer calls me up and says, do you want to come to our TV show tonight and talk about the public perception of a politician? And I said, sure. The beginning of your career, you don't ask any questions. You just walk into a studio and take every media opportunity that you have. And then they invited me again and again and again, and I become a regular guest on that show. When I watched myself and heard myself in the evening on TV, I hated it. It was painful. There were all those other well-spoken political experts who had picture-perfect English, and they used sophisticated words that I didn't even understand what they are talking about. And then in the middle of it, this year. So long story short, at a holiday party, I said together with that TV producer, and I shared exactly what I just shared with you and said, I cannot believe that you invite me again and again and again, despite that mess here. And he said to me, that's exactly the reason why we invite you. You sound like an international expert. And you say things so simple that everybody in front of the TV understands you, but they don't understand the political experts. So something that I thought is actually a weakness has been come my superpower, my differentiation to competitors where I dominate them and they can never copy that mess, right? And so when I look into my audience nowadays, and I think you will have the same observation, Owen, most often we get hired by international companies or by companies with international audiences because they don't look for the average American picture-perfect speaker. And so it is very difficult to find something that you have to offer that your competitor can never offer because we instantly go into some sort of comparison and only think about the things that we do better, but not different. I love that answer. And thanks for sharing that, Sylvie. I think number 16 should be accent, right? That, <laughs> yeah, number 16, yeah. <laughs> to get say, yourself an accent, get one. Exactly, yeah. So the first one is, from Ireland, one of the things that we grew up with is a culture whereby humility is a very important value. And as a result of that, it's very difficult. Like when I first came to New York, even now, yeah. it's always a, a bit of a struggle for me to present myself. Like you've said it to me before, Selvi, the other people in the mastermind said it, people in NSA say it all the time, that I'm unassuming, right? And what they really mean is that they meet me and then they hear about, let's say, my bio or what I've done or whatnot. No, yeah. and they go, Phew. And they can't make the connection between the two, you know, which I don't know what that says, but I do still, and it's not a confidence thing. And it's also not a, I don't see it as a, let's say a weakness per se, but I was wondering if you've got suggestions or tips, because I don't really care what people think in the sense of I've gotten over that. I used to deal with that, but more so how do you walk that fine line? Because in terms of communicating your value, your worth, your USP, for example, but without bragging. First of all, I totally understand coming also from a European background, how difficult it is and how internalized we have humility and not going out there to tell people how amazing we are. That is the one end of the scale. And then there is this super bragger whatsoever other end of the scale. And the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Because first off, if you don't promote yourself, who else will? It is your responsibility only and nobody else's to make sure that the people that you are surrounded by and decision makers, even those you are not in the room with, know about your excellence. You can't say, I'm the best kept secret and keep yourself as the best kept secret. You need to tell people about your capabilities. but there is a right way and a wrong way to tell people. And I think there is a huge difference between bragging and positioning. And so positioning means you bring your achievements into context. 
you not just tell you are the greatest at all and the best at all and the first at all or even humble brag. You bring it into a context. There is one chapter in the book called Achievements and Accomplishments where I apply something called an XYZ method. Instead of just saying, oh, I have spoken around the world, right? And I'm such a world traveler, period. Tell me in how many continents, to how many audiences, to how many people. Put it into a context for us. Add data, facts, and figures that are proven because it will make you more self-aware about the big deal that you are. I mean, you have spoken in how many countries, Owen? I think 34 or so. 31, right? And that is not even bragging. That is facts and figures. There is proof for that. And it sounds very different if you would say, oh, well, I'm a global speaker. I'm just killing it around the world, flying business class every time. Or if you would say, I have impacted 1.5 1.5 million people in 34 countries on six continents throughout the past eight years. That helps us also to understand, oh, wow, wow, that is impressive. Like we experienced you in that mastermind group. When you let go of that feeling that you are humble bragging, but really deliver us the data facts and figures, everybody is kind of, what a big deal he is. Don't tell people that you are a big deal. Show them that you are a big deal. And so what I'm really proud of the book is that I share all those concepts, but also then in the second step, help you to communicate them, to say them in a way that still feel authentic to yourself, but increase your own level of self-confidence and the confidence others will have in you. Love it. One more question before quick fire round. And thanks again for that answer, Sylvie. Is who are some of the best top two or three speakers? I know you know a hell of a lot of speakers. From your perspective, just if you can give us a couple of names of standout speakers and what makes them so good. Well, that is, is that already fire round? Because I feel already no, like, it's kind of like I'm already it's like getting the fire round. as well. There are so many out there, and I think it depends on what you are looking for. I always feel like when I'm looking for really well-crafted and not old school, but traditional and super impactful keynote speaking, when I look for the craft itself on stage, then there is instantly one name that comes to my mind, and that is Mark Sharon Brock. Hall of Fame speaker. When I look into adding value to the audience and taking something super complex and breaking it down to the simplest and tiniest things, that is how to apply words and what to say to the right people in the right moment, then it is Phil F. Jones exactly what to say. When I look into female keynote speakers who are killing it, then Cassandra Riffey is somebody who comes to my mind. Erika Twahan is somebody who comes to my mind. Meredith Elliott Powell is someone who comes to mind. Kendra Hall is someone who comes to mind, who are really helping to break that glass ceiling or however you want to call it. And then when it comes to leadership and everything around psychology and, well, obviously there is Owen Fitzpatrick that comes to my mind that you got to see at least one time in your life on stage, because what I love about you are two things, Owen. First is the depth of no- the depth of knowledge the substance, the significance you bring to your presentations. And second, it's the unexpected element of humor that comes out of nowhere, but hits you and slaps you right into your face. That's, yeah, that's, thank you, Sylvie. That's very difficult for me to listen to that. Again, (laughs) Irish people not only are 
we have the humility stuff going on. We also find it very difficult to accept compliments. I've no doubt that I could ask many different speakers that question and you would be in that list of speakers that you've just mentioned there as well, Sylvie. So I've absolutely no doubt on that. Thank you very much. Let's get straight into the quick fire round. I'm just going to ask you a bunch of questions to throw out whatever comes to mind. They don't have to be the best. Okay. Just whatever you think. First initial oh, thoughts. Favorite movie. Favorite movie, A Good Year. Favorite author. Myself. Love it. Favorite book. <laughs> Guess what? Fantastic. Favorite artist or painter. A guy I randomly found on TikTok. He uses a bicycle and a pot of color hanging over, you say, over the frame. And he's riding the bike while the pot circles around and creates the most beautiful pictures and art hanging in my living room. It's incredible. That's what you call real talent. Love it. Mm -hmm. Favorite position? Two. One is Edith Piaf, a French singer who wrote No Je Ne Regrette de Rien. It's the song that I hear every single day when I go out on my boat first. Yeah. And the second one is U2 and Bono. Good stuff. Irish represent. Oh yeah, no, I didn't even realize that. Yeah. There you go. Love there it. There you go. A philosopher? One of, uh, um, he would probably be surprised if, that I position him as philosopher, but one of the people who always makes me think and stretch and Think outside my box, Dr. John Molidor. Okay, very cool. Desired superpower, you could have any superpower? Lie. Favorite TV series? I don't watch TV. Ideal time travel, past, present, or future, where would you go? You, John, to see my children. Okay. If you could live anywhere else other than where you're living, where would you live? In the south of France, Provence, on Vineyard. And since the first question was, what is your favorite movie? On the chateau that is shown in a good year. Nice. If you could be doing anything other than what you do, what would you be doing? I would own a restaurant in the south of France. In Provence. In Provence. Okay. Somehow included in my chateau. And the problem is I would only serve the food that I like to cook every single day and just have friends sitting around me and enjoying dinner and wine and life with them. Okay. So lastly, last question for you is one piece of advice that you would have for the world if it would put on a billboard. What would your message to the world be if you could say anything to them? Be gentle to yourself. You are doing the best you can. Fantastic. For anyone who wants to know about you, Sylvie, where do they go? They go on the internet, type in my not so easy name, Sylvie Di Giusto, and then they can find my website with a lot of free materials, with a perception audit that you can take so that you understand how the world perceives you as a leader. Or you go on Amazon and you grab a copy, a brand new copy of The Fear Advantage. And right at the beginning, there is my email address. And it's at the end too. I encourage you to let me know what you think about it and what you found out on your journey of self-discovery and it will take a while because it's deep work but i promise you that it's going to be worth it and i will second that promise sylvie as always thank you so much for a wonderful conversation i'm very sure our viewers and our listeners have found this extraordinarily insightful for now my friend i can't wait to see you in person Again, thanks. And by the way, congratulations. You'll be keynoting at Influence, which is the National Speakers Association, the biggest event all year in front of a lot of people. So really excited to see you there. For now, thanks so much, Sylvie, and uh, take care. Thank you very much for having me. I cannot wait to see you again. Me too.